We're here talking to Aid Gibson from Ambulance Control. Aid, can you tell me a little bit about what is Ambulance Control? Certainly, it's usually a room made up of uh, numerous amounts of staff who uh, have different skill sets. Um, and part of that is taking calls, emergency calls, receiving those, triaging those emergency calls. Uh, and putting them onto, into a category. Uh, once the address is verified, they'll go across to dispatch where the controllers will uh, assign incidences uh, to ambulances um, in that order of category. So when a member of the public who's got no first aid experience at all dials 999, what is actually the process? Who is the very first person that answers that call? Well, firstly, when they ring 999, they will go through to the operator, BT, and then that will send that uh, call to the nearest ambulance service. Now, there's two ways that can reach us, either via landline, which is direct from a, a house phone, or from a mobile phone, which is usually triggered from a mast that's nearby. So there's two ways that call can be received. Once that call is received, obviously the first priority is to make sure that the patient is breathing, whether they are or not, and then to get the address. That is the next important thing. So if a member of the public isn't quite sure where they are, are there any easy ways of them getting that data across? Yes, if they're in a high street next to a, they can name some shops, a street name, uh, what three words is, is a good one. Uh, and it's any sort of characteristics, pubs, hills, anything like that, that can be descriptive to help find the, the, the address. Because one of the advantages of being in control is that we do use maps and we can sort of talk our way around or get information from the caller to try and pinpoint their location. So once they've got the location and that's been pinpointed, what other information are they going to need? Well, anything about the patient, really. It's uh, when they make the trouble nine call, we do ask to speak to the patient to get an idea of what they're, what is going on. But if that patient is can't speak or for whatever reason they're unconscious, um, then they need to be next to that patient so we can actually find out what's going on and what's happening. And if a, a first aid perspective needs help, can they give help in, for example, CPR or bleeding? Certainly. Once we, we once we receive the call and we start speaking to the caller, um, we gain or try and gain what the matter is. And depending on what the problem nature is, we will give advice to the caller for the patient or to the patient before the ambulance arrives. So the ambulance has been activated, but if it's something like a defibrillator, is that available as well? Because there's community, community defibs around. How would you actually access or give that information to the well, caller? Once we've validated the address um, from the data set that we hold, it will come up on the incident that there's a, a CPAD site nearby. That will have the location, the distance um, and the, the password to get into the cabinet once uh, they, they, they arrive at the DFIB site. So the call's been processed, so from your side of things, what would then happen? Um, how would you then communicate that over to the nearest uh, paramedic or ambulance group? Well, once the call is received, they'll go through a triage process to find out, determine what the problem nature is, give the, the relevant advice, and that once that triage has ended, the, code will, uh, the call would be coded, whether it's life-threatening or non-life-threatening. Once the address is validated, it will be passed to the dispatch side, and the current controller will assign the nearest ambulance uh, for it to respond. What if the situation gets worse, for example, it's, we're just dealing with a bleed or, or someone, then they go unconscious, can the caller call back 999 or do they have to do uh, something? Certainly different? they can always call back, but usually if, the, if it's a life-threatening call, the person's unconscious, will stay on the line to give them advice until the ambulance arrives. So from your, your side, um, if it's just a single person, it's one thing, but what about when it's it maybe a more, more of a larger thing with multiple casualties? What sort um, of information would you need from a, a first aid perspective or well, an individual? Well, usually if it's multiple casualties, we will see, receive more than one call, so that will give us an indication of what's going on. Uh, certainly in the triage, the questions that we ask will glean a lot of information from there, so we'll, we'll quickly determine whether this is a single person incident or a multi-person incident. Mm. 